Now we're going to go off on another slight tangent to look at another subgroup of immigrants from the 1850s who were also not welcome in Captain Cargill's Otago. This one has a personal significance to me because it involves directly or indirectly almost all of my immigrant forebears. I'm referring to Irish Catholics who on a scale of who Burns and Cargill wanted for their new Edinburgh settlement were off the charts on the definitely not side of things. And for as long as Captain Cargill controlled communications with the immigrant recruiters in Scotland, that sectarian exclusiveness was maintained pretty effectively. But then, in the mid-1850s, the Presbyterian exclusion zone developed a little chink in its armour. And through that gap came just enough Irish Catholics to add a distinctive green tinge to southern New Zealand's pioneer story. One of the most interesting things about these early Irish arrivals in southern New Zealand is how many of them come from the same part of Ireland, which is to say this eastern part of County Galway on the west coast of the country. And the other thing is how they're coming out in a sequence is a classic example of what's called chain migration. And because Otago's early immigration was so tightly controlled, I believe it's possible to identify the very first link in that migration chain. The anchor, if you like, to which so many other Galway migrants' stories connect. That Galway pioneer seems to have been William Kavanagh from Cochinti here in Anadown, who somehow found himself in Melbourne at the time when William Hunter Reynolds was sent over from Otago to recruit labourers on behalf of the new Otago provincial government in 1856. Acting on instructions from the provincial councillors rather than from Captain Cargill, Reynolds was not fussy about a man's nationality or religion. What Otago needed was labourers, men who could do the backbreaking work of building roads, felling trees and breaking swamp and bush into productive farmland. And they were prepared to work longer hours for lower money as well, initially at least, just to get on their feet, you know, poor buggers. And uh, that mean it was tough, doing hard work, doing hard work. And that was exactly what Reynolds brought back with him to Dunedin, including the young Irishman, William Kavanagh. Once there, however, William Kavanagh displayed typical Irish immigrant behaviour. He quickly worked out that if he nominated his friends and relations back in Galway for assisted passages, they wouldn't have to face the same stringent selection process they would have had to go through if applying through the agencies in England and Scotland. Having someone already in the colony to put you up on arrival and support you in the early period meant that those sort of applications from the colony were more or less rubber stamped, even if you were Irish, even if you were Catholic. And this was the Achilles heel of the exclusive Otago uh, selection process. And it meant that over the next few years, one immigrant ship after another arrived in Otago with a smattering of Irish people aboard, many of them from East Galway and selected for passage here by their friends and relations already in the colony. Four of those people were William Kavanagh's siblings and another sister, Cecily, was also due to come to Otago but when her ship was delayed, she returned to Anadown, ended up marrying John Walsh and together with him took over the old family farm and lived in this cottage, which is William's boyhood home. Now just down the road, there's an old well that dates back to Viking times, which was their water source. And in this ancient land, there are cavern of bones buried in the nearby cemetery, going back generations unknown. So why was it that so many of the young men and women of this area left the place so decisively in the mid 1800s? Many of the reasons that prompted so many young Irish men and women to emigrate in the 19th century are exactly the same as for their Scottish and English contemporaries. A sense of constricted opportunities at home and a hope for greater opportunities abroad. But there's one distinctive area that marks out the Irish immigrants and that's the dark shadow of the great Irish famine and Gorta Moor. From 1845 until the early 1850s, successive harvests of Ireland's staple crop, the potato, were devastated by a fungus that made the potatoes rot in the ground. This wrought unprecedented devastation across the Irish countryside. At least one million people died of starvation or from the illnesses that swept through the famished population in its wake. The death toll was particularly high here in the West. 
County Galway was one of the worst affected counties, and this particular parish, Anna Down, lost 40% of its population in the famine decade years between the census of 1841 and 1851. Famine graves and famine memorials are scattered across the county to remember that epic tragedy. One of the worst parts of it is that so much of the suffering was really unnecessary. Ireland remained a net exporter of food throughout the famine crisis. Absentee landlords continued to send shiploads of Irish grain and other foodstuffs over to a sale in markets in England. The Irish tenant farmers and labourers, meanwhile, were expected to subsist on their crops of potatoes. And if there were no potatoes, well, for many landlords, that was just too bad. Every one of those Otago-bound Galway immigrants of the 1850s was a survivor of those dark years. They were either children or adolescents during the famine years. So no wonder they were so keen to leave and no wonder they spoke so little about Ireland in their later years in New Zealand. But more than that, the famine catastrophe wrought decisive changes in Irish society and unleashed a torrent of immigration such that it became a long-term feature of Irish life. The division of land, marriage patterns that all tightened up decisively and subsistence agriculture gave way to cattle rearing on larger land holdings. So if we think about Ireland, there was significant agrarian and political agitation and discord taking place. Uh, various factions, white boys, etc., who were agitating at the time. And there were attempts at you know, revolution, in quote marks, in terms of trying to get independence um, from, from Britain. Post-famine, only one son of an Irish peasant family could expect to inherit his father's tenancy and one daughter of the house could expect to have a dowry to help her arrange a marriage. And if you weren't that son or daughter and you still wanted to get married and have some land of your own, well, going abroad was really your only option to achieve those aspirations. For that pioneer generation of Galway immigrants, getting married and owning land of your own were massive achievements. My great-great-grandparents, William Scully and Annie Finity, were two such immigrants. They both came from this townland of Clune Boo in the parish of Annandown here in Galway. Their families lived in little cottages in a clochan or cluster of cottages that were just around here, and their fathers tenanted small plots of land nearby which they worked communally along with a bunch of other families. Now, William and Annie, as far as we know, were Irish speakers and illiterate, so it's quite amazing. They made their way all the way out to New Zealand, but they were part of that migration chain initiated by William Kavner back in 1856. Now, that migration chain had gradually extended to include dozens of families from East Galway. William Scully was there in Otago in time to be one of the very first miners on the Tuapeka Goldfield in 1861, while his future bride, Annie Finity was an assistant immigrant along with her brother's family arriving at Bluff the following year. They were married in Invercargill in 1864. Like many of the Galway settlers, they then took up bush and swamp covered land on the Southland Plains, in their case, here at Rakahoka. After the backbreaking work of clearing and draining land, they then had a farm of their own. None of that would have been possible back in Ireland, neither the getting married nor getting land. And here in Southland, the land was not rented from a distant landlord like an Anna Down, but it was their very own freehold property at a time when none of their family in Ireland had that privileged status. They were typical of Galway families all around this region at places like Longbush, Mablebush, Grovebush, Woodlands, Dacre, and numerous other spots. And like all those contemporaries, William and Annie also had children who were likewise able to prosper. In fact, so successful was William in his own modest terms that in 1894, he gave a little piece of his farm away. This section was presented to Bishop Moran, the Catholic Bishop of Dunedin, as a site for a new church for the district. And over 125 years later, here it is, still standing and still serving the descendants of the Galway pioneers. Now you might wonder how a bunch of often illiterate and frequently Irish speaking peasants feared in Scottish Presbyterian Otago. What sort of welcome did they get? 
How did they get a start in such an ostensibly hostile environment? Well, for one thing, their labour was so urgently needed and they'd proved such solid workers that the small matter of their religion and nationality could be overlooked by the ordinary Scottish settlers who employed them. And this was true for the Irish men who worked on their farms as well as the women who worked as domestic servants in their home. And on the other hand, there were actually a small number of Scottish Catholics in Otago who acted as a sort of a communal support base for their co-religious in the early years. And of them, the most important family were the Popper Wells of Sunnock near Milton. William Popperwell was from Hutton on the Scottish border near Berwick-on-Tweed. He first came to New Zealand as a mariner and actually delivered a boat to Otago Harbour for the Naitahu chief to Awaiki in the early 1840s. Based in Wellington, he married Catherine McLaughlin, one of the pioneer Highland immigrants to that settlement. In 1846, the young couple returned to Scotland to his home at Sunnock Farm so that William could learn all he could about farming so he could transition to that occupation. Unfortunately, his young Highland bride just didn't hit it off with her mother-in-law, and so they quickly came back to New Zealand applying for passages to Otago and the new Free Church settlement in 1848. Initially turned down as Catholics, according to family tradition at least, they were subsequently able to buy a land package that gave them free passage on the Blundell, which sailed for Dunedin in May 1848. On arrival in Dunedin, William selected some land in North East Valley and began cutting a small farm out of the bush there. But then in 1853, the family sold up and left Dunedin for the Tokamirero Plain. In fact, they made the first journey by a wheeled vehicle into this district. The family established a substantial farm here near Milton, which they called Sunnock, after the original home farm back in Scotland. Now this property became a real haven for the pioneer Galway Irish as well, offering both initial employment and a place to worship. Because when the French priests travelled down from Wellington to Otago, they were based here, saying mass and celebrating weddings and baptisms, at which the Popperwells often served as sponsors. In fact, Sunnock was the focal point of Catholic life in Otago for a number of years. There is one additional tangent off our Irish tangent that we're also going to explore, just briefly. It takes us here to Kerry Town in South Canterbury. This road was once lined with small farms owned by pioneers who came from the eastern portion of County Kerry. That's why it was called Kerry Town. And this plaque marks the site of the convent school established for them by the Sisters of St Joseph, only the second such country convent of this type established in New Zealand. Now these people were a founding group here in South Canterbury, very akin to the Galway people in Otago and Southland. So how does their origin story connect up with our Otago story? Just like the Galway case study in Southland, it's possible to identify the very first Kerry man to arrive here and become the anchor of the chain that so many others would follow. His name was Richard Hoare, and he came from Abbey Dorney Parish in County Kerry. But somehow or other, he took ship on an Otago-bound ship from Greenock, the Robert Henderson, in 1860. So this put him in place to profit from all the gold rush expansion of 1860, and after which he headed north here to South Canterbury, where he got work on the Levels estate working for the Rhodes Brothers. Now, they were apparently, according to family law, so impressed with his work that they asked him if there were any more people like him back home in Ireland, and encouraged him to send for them to come to South Canterbury and work for them. This is the Sleeve Lucre area of County Kerry, a name which means Mountains of the Rushes. It's well known as a stronghold of traditional Irish music and dance, but as the name would suggest, it was also once a very boggy area and a hard place to make a living for subsistence farmers, peasants if you like. Nonetheless, this is the Turanga Waiwai, the ancestral origin point for Brosnans the world over. Back in 2013, there was a world gathering of Clan Brosnan in Castle Island here, at which I was very honoured to be appointed Clan Chieftain, or Kjaun Finna. At that point, we tried very hard to work out exactly where my particular 
family of Brosnans had lived before immigrating, but there are just so many Brosnans in this county, all using the same first names that we just couldn't pin it down to an exact point. This is as close as we could get, this ruined cottage at Garon, where my great-great-grandparents are thought to have lived at the time their first child was born in the early 1840s. But it's from this surrounding district, all of it hard hit by the famine and by the restructuring of Irish society that followed in its wake, that parish after parish, townland after townland, family after family saw their young people grow up only to leave on that long, long journey to New Zealand. This is Castle Island, the market town of the Steve Lucre part of East Kerry. This is where all the farmers from the surrounding district would come in to sell their produce. And it was a great place for them to socialise and catch up on the news. The stories about New Zealand and all the great opportunities opening up there must have featured strongly in much of that chat through the 1860s and 1870s. But all that detailed information about what was going on in New Zealand was coming back informally from immigrants like Richard Hoare had already gone out there rather than from official sources. There was absolutely no promotion of New Zealand in this part of Ireland or information about recruiting immigrants there until well after the first links in that migration chain had been formed. So it raises the question, how did those first migrants from East Kerry find their way to New Zealand? Canterbury Province had the same sort of assisted passages schemes as Otago did in this period, and so it was that when the second ever immigrant ship called in at Timaru, the Achanga, there were aboard 10 immigrants from County Kerry. Now, seven of them were the parents and siblings of Richard Hoare, who had organised those assisted passages for them by nominating them uh, from South Canterbury. But the other three were Brosnahans from a neighbouring parish who had all paid their own way. One of them was my great-grandfather's older brother, Patrick Brosnan. And over the succeeding years, he made sure that all of his siblings, as well as his ageing parents, also got assisted passages to come to South Canterbury. Now, there were some falsehoods involved. My great-great-grandfather, Hugh Brosnan, for instance, was 80 years of age, and that was well over the maximum to qualify for assisted passage to New Zealand. So when he did successfully apply for a subsidised fare, the age against his name in the official records is 55. Nonetheless, he had 22 good years here in South Canterbury, and he farmed right up to the end when he died aged 102 in 1895. This little cob cottage behind me was his home. It was turned into a dairy later on, and his sons built a fine modern cottage just alongside it. The other Kerry pioneers acted likewise. And so a whole subset of East Kerry families transplanted themselves to Kerry Town and then spread out through South Canterbury and beyond. Their descendants are legion. And now, those original pioneers lie together here in the Tamuka Cemetery. And that whole migrant flow tracks back to one young man's adventurous journey to Otago in 1860. This guy, Richard Hoare. He ended his life as a prosperous farmer. He fathered 10 children and bequeathed them a state valued at 4,000 pounds. Not bad for a boy from East Kerry. Now it used to be said that if you were walking down Kerry Town Road and you threw a stone, you'd either had a cow or a Brosnan. Now Kerry Town is now at peace here in the Tamuka Cemetery and there aren't any cows around, but let's see about Brosnans. <laughs> 